Give us one for Wink. Just going to tell us about, uh, about the company that she lives in. Thanks, David. And at this point in time, because I know at least one of the organizers may have to run out before the end of the talk, it's my duty to not only thank you for letting me speak, but especially I think we should thank the organizers for having to put together an incredible uh, conference. I've certainly learned a lot, and I hope everybody else has. So let, let's give a round to... <laughs> so uh, this is going to be a very simple talk. No modular graph functions, no elliptic anything, just a bunch of polylogs. And uh, it's um, going to be about the co-action principle and how it can be applied to full scattering amplitudes in a particular theory called planar n equals 4 super gang mills theory. And uh, you don't need to know exactly what it is. Physicists, well, who work on it sometimes call it the hydrogen atom of the 21st century, but uh, that, that has the same amount of pretentiousness, maybe, as cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just the harmonic oscillator. <laughs> it's just the harmonic oscillator. But uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk about all amplitudes in planar n equals 4. I'm just going to talk about the six-point amplitude. And because we're in bond, I think I should probably draw it like this. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to represent uh, the work on the benzene ring that was done here a while ago. And uh, the nice thing about this theory is it gives us the chance of describing scattering amplitudes to all loop orders and perturbation theory in terms of the same basic function space. Most of the time in quantum field theory, as you go up in loop order, you encounter more and more complicated functions dialogue rhythms at one loop, elliptic functions at two loops, hyper or whatever, so you go to higher loops. But in this theory, at least some of the amplitudes, including this six-point amplitude, is uh, they are uh, going to be, we believe, we conjecture, built out of multiple polylogs. We think the same is true of, the, of all of the components of the seven-point amplitude as well. So <coughs> we're going to consider this theory in uh, d equals 4 minus 2 epsilon. And there will be poles in epsilon. But the good news is we basically know uh, what they look like. And we're going to factor them out and uh, box them off in a function that you don't need to know. So we have an equation that the, And by the way, planar just means that instead of considering all possible Feynman diagrams in this theory, with these six external particles, we're only considering the planar ones. And so there will be many, many diagrams, but they can all be drawn on the plane. So this amplitude here depends on the dimensional regularization parameter epsilon, and it also depends on the dot products of these various momenta. But there's a uh, function which we can call the BDS ansatz, but a actually uh, there's a better one now called BDS like ansatz. And towards the end of the talk, I might mention that that's not quite right either, so <laughs> it has to be upgraded slightly. So this, this function is very, it's fairly simple, but I'm not going to, there's no need to write it down. But the point is, it depends on these generic. Uh, dot products. Whereas the thing that it multiplies has no poles in epsilon, so there's no epsilon in here, and it depends on only three variables. Whereas the generic amplitude of this type in a different theory, there would actually be uh, eight of these uh, Mandelstam invariants. Well, it'd be nine if they would obey a, a con nonlinear constraint. So the eight now has gone down to just three, thanks to uh, an extra symmetry that this theory has, which is called the uh, dual conformal. And so the uh, definition of uh, U, which we'll sometimes call U1, um, 
is uh, k1 plus k2 squared, k4 plus k5 squared. And then uh, v is also called u2, and w is u3. And then these are related by uh, cycling the uh, momenta by 1 mod 6 and uh, by 2 mod 6. So those are uh, the three uh, variables and uh, the, we can make a picture of uh, the space. And this uh, E will be a real function in uh, the positive octant. And it will be important later on that it has a sheet where there are no branch cuts on the planes that go through this cube, like U equals 1, V equals 1, and W equals 1. So it's analytic on this uh, first sheet with no singularities there. So now for a, uh, I mean this whole talk is about conjectures, there are no theorems. Um, but the conjecture is that, well let's, sorry, let's first expand E perturbatively. So that means that L equals zero to infinity. There's some coupling which we call lambda. It's just a Taylor series expansion of that. And this is the L loop order function. And the conjecture is that uh, E, L are uh, weight 2L multiple polylogs. And they're going to belong to a uh, space H, which is a very small subspace of another space G. So let me first uh, define G. So uh, many of you already know what the G functions are. If there's nothing before the semicolon, they're just one. And if there's a list of arguments, A1 to AN, they're just the iterated integrals. weights are zero, okay, so this is a space of uh, multiple polylogs, but this space is way too big. For example, at weight eight, does that you tell us what the y's are? Isn't it? Sorry, I should tell you what the y's are. The y's are related to the u's. Scrooge. Then, yeah, there's a square root relation in one direction, and I'm going to give you the reverse relation, which doesn't have any square roots in it, but if you 
solved it back the other way. There are some uh, square roots. And to get the formulas for V and so on, you, you cycle U to V to W. And uh, then 1 minus U also has a simple uh, representation in terms of the uh, Ys. Okay, so um, let's see. So the whole thing is that these are uh, cubical these y's are cubical coordinates on uh, space uh, sometimes called configuration of six points in CP3. These CP3's are known to physicists as momentum twisters. And uh, so there's a Grassmannian GR46 modded out by some <coughs> uh, projective uh, no, but in the case of six points, this is more general, this doesn't have to be six, but in the case of six points, there is some duality between GR46 and GR26, which lets you also write this as uh, MO, the, the moduli space of uh, six marked points on the Riemann sphere. So this representation is nice when all the y's are less than 1. That's actually a small part of the positive octant. It's a, um, if you look at the unit cube and you draw this plane here, there's a region um, <coughs> where uh, u plus v plus w is less than 1. All the u's are positive, and um, also delta has to be greater than one. So, so when you invert that relation for the y's in terms of the u's, there's a there are square roots of delta, where delta is uh, a cubic form. So for some purposes, the, the y's are very nice, but that, that polylog representation only covers a region where delta is greater than zero, which is in a little bit inside this, this plane, u plus v plus w less than one, between there and the origin. So there's a little region in there which is for which that polylog representation is good. But we're gonna describe things more, a little more abstractly not explicitly in terms of the g-functions, by uh, describing the uh, coaction, or a small piece of the coaction, which is the, uh, we have the pop algebra, and this, uh, there's a piece of the coproduct which has a sum of, uh, This uh, statement here, these, these S's belong to a set which we call the letters of the symbol. And this is just equivalent to partial derivatives with respect to some coordinates, like the XA's being um, a sum over the SI's, which now also depend on the underlying coordinates of these same functions times uh, the derivative of the log of Si with respect to Xa. So this n minus 1 component of the coproduct is just a way of bookkeeping the derivatives if you're a lowly physicist. So how many letters in the row for that? How many letters? Right, the row very good. So Brown discussed the uh, polylogs here. And in these cubical coordinates, there would be a set of letters 
which we could call Sy, and they include three yi's, three one minus yi's, three one minus yi yj's, and uh, well, here I just write all three of them. So this would be ten letters. But actually, and that, I think if we took generic polylogs like that, we would be in this space. But that's not actually what we want. We want to be a little smaller. We want the uh, set of letters we'll call uh, SU, for which there are only nine letters. UI, 1 minus UI, and uh, YI. So th this is actually our alphabet with nine letters. So, for example, the partial with respect to u of f is f u over u, because that's the derivative of log u with respect to u. And then we have another letter, 1 minus u. And so we take the derivative of log 1 minus u with respect to u. And the v and w letters do not contribute to this partial derivative. But then we have a term which comes from uh, taking the derivative of the log of yu with respect to u. And then there are two more terms. I'm not going to bother to write the coefficients, but they multiply uh, the yv and yw co-products. So, uh, As you can see from the benzene ring, we have a dihedral symmetry here. D6. The benzene Sorry, this is uh, only one of the two states of the yes. benzene ring. <laughs> what? Oh, this is your double Well, it really resonates between oh, okay. the, the two places. So, <laughs> so the quantum super, the super <laughs> classically, it might look like D3, but it's really D6. <laughs> <laughs> so the quantum super because it oscillates between this state and the and the one where they're always yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the graph is not the greatest representation for the D6 symmetry. Anyway, the the D6 is uh, this the, the uh, cyclic part of it is uh, generated by an element G, which cycles U to V to W back to you again, but the y's um, are um, order six, so, so they go like that. And uh, there's also, uh, there's another operation, parity, which is g cubed. And that takes the ui's to the ui's, but it flips over the uh, the y on this. So we'll need, or I'll refer to these later. Okay, now we want to uh, trim down this function space uh, of these polylogs. So just to give you a, a hint of why we need to trim it down. So if we wanted to go to uh, four loops, that's equivalent to looking at the weight H functions in this space. If we really were in G, uh, weight H, there's like 1.6 million functions. And uh, we're going to impose a constraint on the branch cuts, which will lead to a subspace, which will have only about 8,000 functions in it. And then we're going to impose another constraint, which gets us down below 1,000, and then there's some other, maybe even more conjectural constraints, but, well, we're pretty sure about them now. Like, the real number of functions we need to that weight is only 372. So what are the constraints on the space 
that allow us to trim it down so drastically. And there, there's a physical constraint that says that branch cuts for um, scattering amplitudes for all massless particles. So they're always at uh, thresholds in two particle invariance. And in our case, the two particles in question are always cyclically adjacent. So they can, there can be branch cuts near two particle invariance being zero or three particle invariance being zero. So those are the only places we can have branch cuts. <coughs> so now we translate that condition into where those are in terms of the cross ratios. So they're only at zero for the two particle invariance or at infinity for the three particle invariance. So in other words, the only branch cuts allowed are at u, v, w equals either zero or infinity. So you see there are nine letters up there, but only the first three, the u's, will be allowed at weight one in our function space. So we're allowed to have log of ui. That has a branch cut at ui equals zero and also at an infinity. But we cannot have log of 1 minus ui because that has a branch cut at ui equals 1. In some of the higher weight functions, after, if we continue and come back on another sheet, we could get a logarithmic singularity there. But we should not have one. There should be a sheet where there is no such singularity. And for the same reason, the log of yi's are, uh, are forbidden. So you're saying in the complex plane, there are only brand points when u is zero or infinity. Correct. So if you write u, each u is e to the x, then it would become an entire function of three variables. There are no brand sheets at all. Well, there will be branches on, on other sheets. Oh. Yeah, it's definitely it's not an entire function. <laughs> but even in the logs. The, I mean not in the use, but in the logs of the use. Well, if you write a single log, it'll, it won't have any problem there, but you'll have dialogues in, in uh, you, and, and when you come back on other sheets... No, but, but I thought you said there's no branching except at zero, the dialogue is branching at one. So we're going to use dialogue of one, one minus the argument in order to put the branch cut at zero, or one minus no, one. No, but, but the dialogue of Jeopardy is where there's three branch points, zero, one, and infinity. It will never become just two. So the this is going to be one of our functions. Well, for example, Li2 of 1 minus 1 over u. Okay. That doesn't, but that still has three branch points. It's zero, one, infinity. But the branch cut at 1 is on another sheet. OK. OK? So we're allowed to have the branches on the next sheet. But we have to find have a sheet where there aren't any branches, okay. where there isn't a branch at u equals 1, where there isn't a yeah, logarithmic singularity. So uh, yeah, the, the derivative of this only involves log of u, and then it has a u one minus u in the denominator or something. Any other questions? So, so we're going to build up the space by insisting that the derivatives or coproducts take us to lower weight functions in the same space, but when we hit weight one. We have to be just in this subset. So that's what gets us from 1.6 million to 8,000. But there's another kind of branch cut constraint, which has to do with the compatibility of branch cuts in two different channels of double discontinuities. And this was observed in 1960 by Steinman. And 
most quantum field theorists don't know about it because it was sort of buried in the lore of Reggie theory, which uh, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> went its own way at some point. When I was at uh, Amati Fubini and Sprangelini, he certainly knew about it. But Lev Lopatov, he uh, knew Reggie theory and he also worked in amplitude. So he brought it to the attention of people working in the field. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the Steinman relations say. Now, actually, the Steinman relations are rather tricky to uh, impose in theories with all massless particles. In principle, they apply to discontinuities in two particle channels, but these are actually very tricky to separate. But the three particle ones can be uh, established. For, um, uh, so I'm just going to take a piece of the Steinman relations that applies to this case. And it says that the discontinuity, when we go to the vicinity of k1 plus k2 plus k3 squared near zero, and also take a discontinuity in k2 plus k3 plus k4 squared of the six-point amplitude, that should be zero. And um, this also applies if we divide by A6 uh, BDS, well actually not BDS, but only BDS like. So the BDS like was an improvement because it allowed us to remove this and apply the same condition directly to this function uh, E of all orders. So, uh, so what is this uh, relation do, it um, forbids certain kinds of functions at weight 2. So it forbids uh, log squared of u, for example. If we look at u there, in the denominator, it has two different three-particle invariants. k1 plus k2 plus k3 squared and k3 plus k4 plus k 5 squared. So if we take log squared, there's a cross term which has log of k1 plus k2 times log of k3 plus k4 plus k5 squared. And, and so that has this double discontinuity and we can't have it. So when you're discussing the Steinman relations, it's better change letters a little bit in the alphabet and write down A, which is U over VW. If you take U and V and W, you'll get a combination that allows you to have in it K2 plus K3 plus K4 squared. Actually, it ends up being squared. And then the rest of the stuff is things involving only two particle invariants. And similarly, B, which is V over W, U, and C, which is W over U, V. These will only contain the other uh, three particle guys. So it separates out the three particle guys. So we are allowed to have things like log squared u, I mean log squared a, and log squared b and log squared c. So these are OK. And in fact, we can write the whole space for the final conjectural uh, weight 2 part of h, and it has Li2 of 1 minus 1 minus 1 over ui. So there's three functions of this type. And then log squared of a, b, and c, which I could also just rewrite as uh, 
in this form. And then here's something interesting. Mm -hmm. Zeta 2 is not a free element of this space, um, where this space means the small space we could possibly jam these amplitudes in, and all their derivatives into. It does enter one of the functions, but it's always linked to logarithms. And these have to be related by the dihedral symmetry. But that so. depends what sheet you're on, what multiple is by squared you have to do. Well, I'm defining it with respect to the sheet in which there is no uh, discontinuity near u equals 1. So, as an example, the, the one loop, this by the way, is there are actually two amplitudes in this game for the six point. One of them is called the MAC amplitude. And uh, when you calculate it, you find that it is, this one is dihedrally invariant. And uh, this guy does the job. I should say that there are also, there's an NMHV amplitude, which is uh, generically a uh, six vector under the dihedral symmetry. But it, at uh, one loop, it's really a three vector. And it has uh, the form So this is u, v, and w, and then you can cycle it around to get the other permutations. So, so these are two, well really, four elements of the six are already found as amplitudes themselves. So far, I only showed you functions in this function space, which only had a letter involved the first six letters, the ui's and the one minus ui's, and that's all there is at weight two, but at weight three, the first parity odd function appears. And um, sometimes we call it phi six tilde. It is proportional to the inter Feynman integral in phi cube theory with six legs and just scalar interactions evaluated in, in six dimensions where it becomes, um, um, so this is symmetric under an S3 uh, subgroup of V6. So it's uh, odd, this is odd parity. So it's, it has a G cubed on it is minus one, but it's even under the other, uh, uh, this normal subgroup or something. Anyway, um, so the way we want to characterize it is by um, writing down its coproducts. And because it's the first parity odd function, if we take a coproduct with a coaction with these uh, <coughs> ui or 1 minus ui letters, that would have to give because these letters are even, and this function's odd, that would have to give something odd. But this is the lowest weight odd guy, so these all have to vanish. And because this thing is totally symmetric, the only one, one of these we have to specify to describe it, basically, is uh, this one, the yu coproduct. And that actually gives this same cyclic sum of Li2s that we saw is in the one loop amplitude. And then <coughs> two of these other functions that belong to this space. Now, I wrote these four zeta 2s here, and they, they do an important thing for you. If you work it out and you take the limit of this uh, function so this depends on u, v, and w and if you take it into the limit that uh, you either go to 0, 1, 0 or uh, 0, 0, 1 then you can check 
that this function vanishes. And what this is, and what fixes these zeta twos here, is it's the branch cut condition we were talking about before, but you're imposing it now at higher weights, where you have the uh, issue of getting into trouble with uh, branch cuts that are zeta valued, have zeta, zeta values in front of them. Let me illustrate a slightly simpler case. Suppose we have an even function, and uh, we take the derivative with respect to f. It contains an f1 minus u over 1 minus u. So we have an issue as u goes to 1, we're going to get a branch cut. There are some other terms, but by going to the right point on the u equals 1 sheet, we can avoid them. Um, but we need to impose that f1 minus u as uh, uvw goes to, in this case, 1, 0, 0 is equal to 0. So there are constraints on coproducts of even functions of this form and coproducts of odd functions involving their odd letters of this form. And so we have to impose these. So we have to sort of reimpose the branch cut conditions. at each order. And the, but this actually does not fix too many. It's a simple uh, thing to impose. OK, so, so let me uh, describe the strategy again. To construct the space at weight w, we assume that we already have the space at weight w minus 1. Then we write down for the derivative of the weight w functions we insert arbitrary linear combinations <coughs> for these first coproducts. That is too many functions because we, they won't generically satisfy the equality of the mixed partial derivatives with respect to two different variables. The d squared of the function is zero, basically. That imposes some integrability conditions. And we can solve those uh, linear system of equations. And after we solve those, we still have a few extra variables to fix. And those are fixed by these branch cut conditions. And um, possibly also there's some analogs of the Steinman. Uh, there are some variations, of, uh, uh, um, versions of the Steinman conditions that we have to impose too. So are we now down to 372? So uh, almost. We have uh, an issue with zeta. Other than a uh, question of which zeta values we include mm -hmm. as constants, we are, we're getting close to 372. And uh, let's see, so I started at three, so I need to have a little bit more time. So one of the reasons I wanted to present this material here is that the construction that we have where we solve these integrability equations, it's very non-canonical. And it starts to generate lousy rational numbers. <laughs> and I think somebody here would be able to, if they put their mind to it, figure out how we should solve this whole thing canonically. <laughs> lousy numerators or lousy denominators? <laughs> Rational numbers? Yeah. Lousy denominators. Lousy denominators you should get rid of. Yeah, Lousy definitely. We, we feel in our bones that we should get rid of it. But let me uh, sort of illustrate the space. Uh, I won't show you every single function in it after a while, but I'll just start counting them. So I already showed you this one here. And then some of the things we have are Li3s of this nice argument. And uh, <coughs> one thing I will say we don't have in the 
as uh, three elements of the space is uh, zeta 3 at a weight 3. And the only one we have at the odd weight is this d equals 6 integral. The semicolon here divides even and odd. Maybe I should have drawn a line for it. Parity even. And this sort of stuff here, where there are no y variables, just for shorthand, we'll call it HPLs, because they come out of the space of harmonic polylogs. And then we have non-HPL stuff. And by the way, now we're at uh, So I, we're going to run out of uh, uh, the ability to write these down pretty quickly. So then we'll just write some numbers instead. And here's the weight. So at zero, we just have one total, which is even. And it's also in this trivial space. And then at weight one, we have three, which are all even and trivial. And uh, then we get six. And then at weight three, we get uh, 13. The only non sort of Y containing one is over here. Is this for an H view for everything? This is the function space that should describe all the six point amplitudes, mm -hmm. namely MHV and MHV. Yeah. So is anybody back there typing this into OEIS? <laughs> <laughs> and we imagine that you've done so already. Because <laughs> you're going to fail soon. <laughs> yeah. Around here. Yeah. I can't find any solution past about here yeah. in OEIS. Mm -hmm. Well, lucky for you, I'm running out of room here. So. And, the, and does Zeta 5 3 appear in its own right up there? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So there is no Zeta 3 here in this odd space, but there is a, a zeta 4. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing at constant level at this weight, at weight 5, and at weight 6, there's only zeta 6, nothing at weight 7, only zeta 8, only zeta 10. Wow. Yeah. So in terms of free wow. elements, we, we hate the uh, odd zeta values. We hate yeah. multiple zeta. We love five squares. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so there are a lot more things in here. The sort of generic thing I wanted to mention is that we can now search this space once we've constructed it. And each, uh, at each loop order, we find, we, we try to calculate four preferred elements and then that are parity even and three more that are parity odd. And we've been able to do this all the way up to weight 12, which contains E6, um, which contains four, four functions here and three functions over here. So we have these seven sort of physical functions at very high weight. And we can take these coproducts to come down. And by the time we get down very low, we sort of achieve saturation. It's like genealogy. Yes. Most people have four grandparents and eight great grandparents. If you belong to certain royal families, you might have fewer, okay? But everybody, once they get back to their 30th great 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 grandfather, those people have to be some of the same people because if you calculate two to the 30th, it's more than there were people on Earth. So, so it's the same thing here. We go, we go back to our ancestors, and then we find they overlap. But, but when we were working with too big a space, we figured it out by the fact that the saturation happened at smaller numbers than we actually had constructed. And so we figured we had people who weren't in the right gene pool, you know? We had uh, these interlopers, and we had to figure out how to trim them. And that led us to the Steinman relations, and now it's also led us 
to not put generic zeta values in here. Could you be missing something else? Uh, it's quite possible, but what we do know is that because we have enough weight 12 representatives, we achieve saturation oh. to weight 7. Right. And so this week, I got a little nervous because I tried another exercise and I managed to get 369 out of 372. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure it's really 372, yeah. and we just don't happen to fill it out yet. So, you know, the, these numbers are sort of solid. We need all of these functions. And um, so this is really the story of the n minus 1 comma 1 element of the coproduct. But there's more to the coproduct than that, as everybody knows. And so we would like to explore the sort of general p comma q element of the coproduct where p plus q adds up to n, adds up to the weight. Uh, but we don't know much about, uh, <clears throat> so what we're trying to ask, so by construction, delta n minus 1 f is, um, um, you know, this belongs to the same space f because the thing on the front has to obey all these same, uh, has to be built off of the same restricted set of functions down here. And then there's this k, which is just a d log in the case of 1. So this has weight n minus 1. And so if we ask about something like this, we have the problem that we don't know much about this space for general u, v, and w. So we're going to do the poor man's version of this, and we're going to go to the point 1, 1, 1, where all of our multiple polylogs evaluate the multiple zeta values, and we're going to ask, which zeta values do we see? They will be basically numbers, right? The number is higher than 1. Um, sorry? We don't have numbers. We don't have functions, I think. Functions always weigh 1, like in polylog. Yeah, you just said that there are multiple zeta values. They're going to be multiple zeta values. Yeah, but so, yeah. So, yeah, but an idea what kind of numbers you have, like, well, see how it is. Yeah, I'm about to write them down here. Right. Try to... Oh, the are you talking about getting more information about KQ? Maybe not much, you know. The, the problem is that you exhausted the best source for information by looking for functions. The only extra thing that you can do if you, if you look at the general PQ correction is that you get information on numbers, like cutting off number letters from your, from your F alphabet instead of Functions. That's so that be a, but will be a smaller amount of information that you get, but maybe you still get something extra. Possible. Yeah, I think what you're saying is what I'm going to do now is write down the space of multiple zeta values that all of these functions evaluate to at one one one. And um, I'm not saying that's the only. I think there's more to this yeah. co-action than that. But I don't yeah. get. And, and I'll show I'll show you one other. Uh, Example. Write down the numbers. So, so anyway, <laughs> right here. <laughs> yeah, David can't wait. So, so basically, uh, sure has. the uh, thing that you get, it's the same weight over here, but I'm just going to, you get nothing until weight 4, where you hit zeta 4. And then at weight 5, you get just one guy, 5 zeta 5 minus 2 zeta 2 zeta 3. And then here you get zeta 6, yeah. but as you might have guessed already, no zeta 3 squared. No. And, uh, and that comes from moments of truth. <laughs> and while I'm waiting, well, to give me the Oh, oh you, you're just <laughs> waiting for that, are you? Okay. The next line. Uh, here we go. I'm too slow. Well, there's a zeta 8 here, and then the comma, and then the pregnant pause. There it is. Precisely this, the single value combination. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And in the way you're. Uh, no, no, so, so it's not, not the single value. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> rubbish, rubbish. Yeah. Like I think. I mean. Sorry, there was another comment or question? Yeah, keep going. I mean, some of these numbers. Yeah, so now we go to weight 9. We get. Uh, this is where we. Anyway, get more uh, data. 6 zeta, 4 zeta, 5 minus 7. Zeta 9, Zeta 2, Zeta 7, minus Zeta 3, Zeta 6, 3, Zeta 3, Zeta 6, 
minus five zeta nine. I'm not saying I've chosen a very good basis here because I don't know what I'm doing. There are three up at weight 10, but I'm gonna, in the interest of time, not write them down. But uh, I see Don's moved up front, so he's getting interested here. <laughs> here, I'll write one. Since, you're sitting, since you moved up front, I'll write zeta five three plus uh, 25 zeta five squared. And there's one more that's very long here. Okay, now, these, this series of numbers is consistent with this co-action principle for general P and Q. And uh, without belaboring it, there, there is this derivation that Francis Brown wrote down, D, D2N plus one. So we have D3, D5, and so on. You expect some CF2, uh, Galois conjugate as the weight five piece. Um, yes, I screwed up. I forgot the zeta two. Okay. Sorry. Just, just to test the uh, readership. <laughs> okay, so, so you're right. I have to have this here for D3 to be consistent. Yeah. Very good. And uh, then you'll notice that there's no zeta three. And so that means that there should be no zeta three squared because that has a co-product of the zeta three in the front. So we explain the absence of this. So where I put an arrow, uh, that's where we get something that is new that then serves as input to higher weight. So the absence of zeta three is new. The absence of the other linear combination of zeta five and zeta two, zeta three is new. We get two, two more new, which we call dropouts, at weight seven. Here, we actually don't get any dropouts. These two coefficients are linked. There are two equations. One comes from D5, which drops you down here, where there was one missing. And one comes from D3, which drops you down here. And so those two relations that you're consistent with the coaction fix these two equations. And when you go up to weight nine, Many of them are related by the co-action principle, and there's one more new, so I put one arrow there. All the new ones seem to come at odd weights. We don't know why that is. But our uh, function space <coughs> doesn't just generate multiple zeta values. It does it at this point, one, one, one. But we can go to other points and find uh, other uh, uh, spaces. So we can get Euler sums in two different ways at two different points. The alternating sums? Full the alternating sums, otherwise I'll get them in. Alternating. Just alternating sums. Good. So at point A, we send UVW to uh, 1 half, 0, 1 half. Now sending a point to 0 introduces uh, logarithmic singularities. So we have log of the k for some k is times the Euler sums, or alternating sums. And uh, sorry, I wrote this. Uh, we get, in this case, we have no dropouts. So we get all until um, weight uh, 6. And then as a function of the weight, the number that are missing, and maybe I'll just write the number that are missing that are new, that are not, because the co-action principle, again, predicts things that, so I'll just write the ones that aren't predicted by the co-action principle. So it weights six, seven, eight, nine, which is as far as we've been able to push it so far. We are missing one, one, three, five new ones, plus others that were uh, derived from Above. And uh, just one more point, and then I'm about to wrap up. Wait a second, you promised to submit that other research? That's a nice number. Okay. <laughs> you promised <laughs> promise us to nominate. So far, every number I see the denominator is one. Which is a one half on the board. So I said something about lousy denominators. Yeah, but so far they're all one and two. Well, so the lousy denominators are not in, these are dimensions of function spaces, so they're all integers. But, well, no, here you're uh, Oh, sorry. So the lousy denominators are 
when we solve the integrability conditions. So we get uh, relations that describe the derivatives of weight w functions in terms of weight w minus 1 functions. And those are guaranteed to be rational numbers because we're solving equations that could be integer valued. But because they're large systems, sometimes we get very nasty rational numbers in the representations of the derivatives of functions in terms of the next lower weight functions. And that's the thing where I believe there should be a canonical the construction of this space. So no, I don't show you any, any rational numbers. You don't want to see them. Some of them are like 30 yeah. or 50 digits long. And but it's just like the prime factors. So the great big prime yes, factors. very big prime factors. Just like that's always the question because we don't care what the actual number is. Yeah. What prime, those, for what primes they're, does the system They're, they're typically uh, pretty big denominators. You can. No, you've got I mean, a thousand factorial has to be very no, big, it has small I think, prime I think they have bad primes. The, the I mean, is there primes. is a way to improve this. There's a, a LLL, lattice reduction sure. method. So that's, that was applied in part of the analysis, and that definitely improves the rational numbers. And then you tend to get, when you at least when you represent the amplitudes in terms of those bases, you tend to get very small rational numbers at that point. And so then you say, I have a good basis. Yeah. And when I say small, I mean the denominators have threes, maybe fives, but nothing worse. So that, that's really good. Sometimes initially you have a bad basis and you get sevens and you know, bad primes down there. No, but seven is not a big prime. No, seven is not that. Do you get big primes this <laughs> After you do it, well, no, are there still some primes that you can't get rid of? Because that would be very interesting. I mean, probably there's something strange is going on with the systems. Uh, the problem is we have, we have a mishmash of techniques, and we used LLL at something called the symbol level, and then we had to complete it at the function level, and we weren't able to mesh that with LLL. So anyway, we get lousy primes, and not for a good reason. We, we think that the lousy primes are artifacts of bad, bad solutions, and they should really not be there. So let me just list uh, one other uh, point that we are at. <coughs> it's, it, it, could, yeah, could question. Round up in, in three minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just show you this here. I'll just rewrite it over here. So, so the point B is infinity, zero infinity. And I'm going to write the same table, except it starts at one. And uh, the number of new missing ones is. In this case, we get a dropout at, this is called log 2, basically, at the first weight. And then we get another one at weight 4. Oh, and by the way, I have to uh, thank uh, Eric Panzer. And if Francis were here, I would thank him too, because they explained to us all how to do this. Um, how to organize things properly. Anyway, there is no, no, we don't find an additional one through weight 9, for whatever it's worth. So all I want to say is that we have these alternating sums at two different points, but they kind of have totally different behavior, mm -hmm. and at which point we get uh, dropouts. My final confession is that I lied, and we needed another fudge factor to actually put these amplitudes exactly into this space. So we, we have one function of the coupling that involves only ordinary zeta values, no multiple zeta values, and you have to that was the second like in BDS like like. You have to, in order to jam these functions into this nice Galois coacting representing space, you have to put in this, this fudge factor. But it's still very non trivial that everything works. So that's what I want to say. Thank you for ending exactly on time. Don can go now that we can ask for that. Short remark is here in the T minus two calculation uh, that also at odd weights you seem to have less objects and at even weights, but okay. it's a very weak uh, statement. Okay. Because you, you know, I, 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 I've got your paper, but I it's, didn't get a chance uh, to look at it yet. I'm going to gonna look at it on the weekend. <laughs> Sorry. All right.
Yeah, mm -hmm. Herbert, to, to separate it by these special points, why just one half, zero and half, or why always the zero in the middle? Is there a, um, is it symmetric in those three that you could? Well, yeah, it's totally symmetric. Okay. The fact that I put the zero in the middle is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. I could have put it on either end. Mm -hmm. But you always have to take one zero. So there is the statement that when you set one of them to zero and two of them equal, then in that case you get a function of one variable, but you can trade it for uh, uh, y parameterization. And then the letters on this line, call it S prime or something, are uh, or the polylogs are like this. And these are the HPLs with weights 0, 1, and minus 1. And they naturally lead to alternating sums at particular points. I mean, interestingly, if we take all three of them to be equal, then we get uh, something like So these give us uh, cyclotomic polylogs with uh, six groups of unity and stuff. And we should look at this more, but the one place where we thought we would get something interesting, or maybe there's another point on this line that's interesting, but, but if we go back to 1, 1, 1, then everything has to collapse back into the multiple zeta value space. So, but maybe there's another point on this line. But yeah, maybe, we should actually, we should definitely look at this and try to, uh, have to check this out. Maybe we can find interesting coactions in the space of six groups of unity too. We just haven't looked at it yet. So I've got a comment. Um, maybe you shouldn't be apologizing for your final fudge. I mean, what you're trying to do is to maximize the mathematical simplicity. So an iterative BDS, like, yeah. like, like, yeah. smacks of what uh, 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 Francis does with his epsilon 1 prime. He just keeps on. I'm not really apologizing because the smaller space will allow us to enumerate the functions. Yeah. And so whatever we can do to get into it, uh, we'll do it. But what we don't, what I kind of would like to understand is what is the meaning of the fudge factor? Yes. Is there a natural scheme from the point of view of quantum field theory that lands you in the smaller space? And we don't know what that is right now. Uh, because you're getting rid of epsilon. Right, is, is, is dealing with a problem that we don't really understand. It's all in the infrared. You're dealing yeah, with Yeah, no, you're right. It's, uh, related it's, to it's not the hot algebra, so people understand it's not the hot algebra of renormalization.